one of the first questions I, I get when I talk about snails is why snails? What, what are you thinking? This is um, something we don't like. Uh, they have a bad rap. Most people are gonna tell you or snails eat your garden and your hostas and your vegetables and anything that you wanna plant. Well, uh, I'm here to hopefully sway you to learn a little more about snails and that we actually have over 115 different species of land snails in New York state alone and over a thousand in North America. That's a lot of different species of snails. It, it's actually, the total numbers are more species of snails than there are birds. So how about that? Now, the ones that are in your garden eating things are invasive snails. They're not from here. They're ones that came over either accidentally or sometimes on purpose from other lands, from Europe, from the African continent, from the Asian continent. And they have, uh, like many other invasive plant, plants and animals in North America, they've disrupted the ecosystem. Uh, so those are the ones you can dislike. I'm not here to talk about those today. And what little I do say about them is very minimal. So uh, I'm here to help introduce you to snails that you might not know even exist right under your feet. One of the things that got me interested in snails from a very early age, and nobody encouraged me. In fact, I was born of Brooklynite homophob homophobic. Oh, what a terrible thing to say. Biophobic parents. Well, um, there, yes, other things we could say too. Boy, um, yes. Um, biophobic meaning a dislike of um, slimy things in nature, which is, includes snails. And uh, so I was not encouraged, I was discouraged. But, but one of the first things that really made me feel uh, um, a connection to these strange little animals was when I saw heartbeat for the first time. So as you can see, the snail in this photo image here, it's, it's turned, um, what some people like to say is upside down. It's showing it's, it's what we technically call the umbilical side. And on that side, you can actually see the snail's heart beating. Within the shell are the snail's organs. And what I'm going to have you look at is in this yellow circle, there's a two-chambered heart. It has uh, an atrium and a ventricle, and it pumps the uh, clearish fluid called hemolymph, which is the snail's blood through its body. So in this next, we have here is a video that I took. So very carefully, just take a look at that. You can see my cursor. You can nod if you, if you see it. So that is the beating heart of the snail. And um, what, what a nice connection we have with a lowly misunderstood little animal. I found this snail in Ellis Hollow and it volunteered to let me take a video of its heart. All right, so with that, we're gonna talk about a few essential things to give you kind of a land snails 101. So first of all, uh, we'll talk about, a little bit about their biology and what makes a snail a snail. And we're gonna talk about ecology and then uh, how does this relate to you? What, what might you do about snails in your life? How can you support them? So, all right, so in the scheme of things, snails are mollusks. And they're related to what most people think of mollusks are the sea creatures. So you think of marine clams and marine snails. When you go to the beach and you find seashells, those were all made by mollusks. And most of the time you don't see the mollusks who make them. So there's a little bit of a mystery there too. They're out uh, in their habitats in the marine <laughs> waters. Uh, but, um, Snails, specifically gastropods, uh, which means stomach foot, because of their strange anatomy, evolved from aquatic, uh, originally from marine gastropods. And there was not one instance of them coming on land and surviving, but rather uh, snails uh, have had a number of 
of uh, um, experiences on land over evolutionary time when seas dried up, when water changed from being saline to brackish to fresh water. And uh, now we have snails all over on all continents except Antarctica. So that's gastropods. And what we're gonna be talking about today is specifically the land snails. So um, you, you can think of the uh, three major groups of snails. We've got, as I said, the marine snails, also freshwater snails. So your ponds and lakes and streams and rivers have snails in them too. But today we're gonna to be focusing on land snails and that's my favorite topic. Slugs are snails too. Just because they don't have a shell or a visible shell, uh, it doesn't mean that they don't really have essentially the same anatomy and uh, the same similar habits. Um, we've got lots of different types, uh, species of slugs in North America, and thankfully most of them are actually native. This happens to be an invasive one. And yes, it might go after you, your cucumbers in your garden if, if you have some uh, and you've seen these. But again, we'll minimize that. This is one of our, our, our fine native snails. Again, this one was from the Ellis Hollow Nature Preserve of, uh, uh, forever grateful for Finger Lakes Land Trust lands that are keeping these and keeping the habitat. What is it that makes a snail on land able to survive? So uh, this is something that's, it's a very wet surface of its body, of its integument. It has a shell that helps it from drying out, but really the greatest threat to any land snail is the possibility of desiccation, drying out. So um, for that, they have mucus. So the skin is exuding at all times some mucus and there's actually different types of mucus glands and different mucus for different reasons. Most of it keeps the snail moist and some of it helps the snail glide along. You can see the silvery trail behind this snail. I'm sure you've all seen silvery trails of slugs and snails on sidewalks and rocks and trees and stuff. And, stuff. and um, the other thing that helps keep snails going is that most of their behavior is nocturnal. So they're gonna be out at night when it's cooler, damper, more humid. Uh, and um, they tend to uh, use homing behavior. So a snail never wanders too far from home. We actually like to call these organisms of low vigility. So they don't go very far in their entire lifetime. They have uh, um, their places where they have, uh, inhabit our leaf litter, damp leaf litter, under rocks, under logs, under coarse woody debris, in the woodlands, around uh, lichens, around fungus, and at the base of plants that like uh, ferns is often where you find them. And it's cooler and it's moister there. And then when they want to feed or roam around, they do so at night and they the homing part is that they return to where they were from uh, as a safe spot. And the other thing that snails do that helps them live uh, a, a, their best life is they hibernate in the winter and they estivate in the summer. Uh, hibernation is what do you think of as it is that many animals will become inactive in uh, the colder months and snails are equipped with uh, glycerin in their blood called hemolymph. Uh, their blood is called hemolymph and the glycerin prevents them uh, the, uh, from having ice and crystallization that would destroy their tissue. So they are able to, to live um, and they tuck up into their shells and they form what's called an epiphram over the opening of the shell to keep them even more secure in there and prevent them from freezing. And in the summer, when we have hot, dry seasons, they'll also become inactive. And that's called estivation. And that's the basics on how a snail works. So um, snails are quite alien in the way their bodies are. They're not like any insect. They're not like, certainly not like any, any vertebrate, although they have quite a few odd things in common with us. But uh, everything about a snail in its development is turned uh, 180 degrees with respect to the head. So uh, that means when you're seeing the anus of the snail be labeled here, my goodness, what's going on? Well, the snail's eating with its mouth. Within the shell is its digestive tract. 
And yes, sure enough, it dumps out towards the front of the snail. Um, and it gets even more interesting when you see that genital, genital pore. Now snails, most of our land snails, back all, um, 99.9% .9 of our land snails in North America are hermaphroditic. So they are, have both male and female parts within. And look at all the wonderful things that are existing in the, inside the shell of a snail. Uh, and this is where you start to think, huh, that looks a little weirdly familiar. Yes, they have a heart. We know that now. And they also have organs and they have a stomach and a digestive system and a kidney and a digestive gland and a lung. Uh, that lung, you can actually see it's a vascularized region of uh, very thin tissue. And just like us, they're taking in oxygen from the air and releasing carbon dioxide. And what is this? Talk about aliens. So yes, you are indeed seeing the penis and the vagina of a snail it, it are up at front, um, which makes mating very interesting and involves the neck. Uh, and of uh, uh, a, a, just a most alien animal, uh, immensely interesting. Let's go on. Um, so um, snails do all these things to survive, which have extraordinary adaptations. Uh, for one, um, most of our snails are equipped with a very toothy radula. Radula comes from the Latin, which means to scrape. And snails don't chew their food like you and I do. These are not exactly teeth, but they're rather little chitinous barbs that are arranged in very neat rows and columns on a tongue-like structure. And they will scrape their food and it'll bring up bits into the mouth and they swallow. So this is uh, an enlarged uh, um, micrograph of uh, radula and different snail species have different types of teeth on the radula depending on what they eat. Uh, most snails are eating soft fungus and uh, decaying vegetation. Um, yet some snails actually eat other snails. We'll learn about that later. So the barbs on the radula are gonna look different. So one of the other things that I did when I was a child and I was a bullied child because I was quite excited the first time I ever noticed that, oh my gosh, you can actually hear snails chew. So I'm gonna do my best and see if this comes through. Uh, I, I always said, well, hey, guess what? When I am a grown up, I am gonna make a recording. And it was uh, uh, Lang Elliott helped me make this recording of a snail. Let's see if this works. Is this actually coming through? Hold on. I don't think I can hear it, Marla. Hang on. Now? Well, um, kind of at the threshold of human hearing. Let me see if I can get it to come through if I take the, the phones out. That's better. <laughs> There we go. You hear that crunchy? Yeah. It's like scraping. It sounds a little bit like if you took a, a hair comb and you scraped your fingernails. And it... Plug back in. I think that was the only way that was going to work. Okay, great. All right. You believe me now? Yeah. You do. Okay. Okay, uh, and so back to breathing. Snails breathe air just like you and I, but instead of having two nostrils, they have one pneumostome, which literally means breathing pore. And um, you, you may have seen this. If you ever observed a snail or a slug, there's this hole. And the hole, it doesn't open and close rhythmically, but rather it opens once in a while, and lets air in and lets out the carbon dioxide and it leads right to the snail's lung. So if you have it backlit like this, you can actually see into the snail's lung. It's, um, it's kind of neat. 
snails get along um, by what we call a foot. It's not analogous at all to our foot, but it's just a very strong muscle. And these ripples on it, you can see, helps them to cling to things and to pull themselves along. There's ripples in it, the, the muscle ripples and moves in a prograde fashion. So it's just constantly gripping everything in its path. And the mucus helps it stay stuck to things so they can crawl vertically and upside down and everything else. But back to reproduction, if you're not having enough fun yet, yes, pretty darn alien. Some of our species of land snails in North America and elsewhere have something called, I'm not making this up, a love dart. Yes. So this little calcium barb is made by the snail in what's called a love dart gland, and it's stored in a love dart sack. And for a long time, nobody really knew the function. And there's this wonderful, charming paper from the 1970s, uh, science paper to try to explain it. And the title amuses me so much. It's called Love Darts, colon, a gift of calcium, question mark. And what happens is one snail is shooting a love dart into the other snail. And I've observed snails in my terrarium that actually have love dart. This one here even has one straight through its head. I don't think it hurt. I think it liked it. Uh, and the love dart uh, is not a gift of calcium. And that, that would, that's a very nice, lovely idea. But rather, we know now from doing mass spectrometry, we can identify that there's a little bit of a hormone at the tip of it. And the hormone helps ensure that the receiving snail is going to retain the sperm of the donor snail and that it will fertilize its eggs. That is a fun fact. If you ever see anything like this, um, that's what's going on. Now, if you ever see anything like this, um, you are watching snails or slugs in this case in the act. Um, different snails and slugs mate in different fashions. And uh, a lot of them just, just line up with their necks next to each other where they're going to exchange sperm with each other. But uh, these slugs, the leopard slugs, do it a little differently. They hang from a mucus thread, usually at night. They twirl around each other, and there's a courtship going on. And what are you seeing here? This white, uh, almost flower-like, petal-like uh, structure that's beneath them, believe it or not, is their two penises everted and in use and twirled around each other where they're exchanging sperm. How weird is that? Now, if you go to YouTube, you, you, you can go to this link, you can go to any link um, uh, that um, is, uh, it's, it's snail porn, okay, just say it. But if you just look up slugs mating, especially leopard slugs mating, there's an especially good one out there with Sir David Attenborough explaining the process. And, there, and there's lovely violin music in the background. It's quite enjoyable. You might like that. So after snails, and slugs mate, uh, what happens? They make lots of eggs. Uh, and not only lots of eggs, this, this happens to be an introduced species I use just for illustration purposes. And I counted 88 eggs at the end of its laying escapade. And yes, it, again, uh, with the vagina being positioned in the neck, this snail is pumping out eggs from its neck. How weird is that? Um, so here's the total amount, the clutch of eggs. Uh, but snails can lay anywhere from one to 100 or more than 100 eggs. It happens that the introduced and invasive snails are so successful because they lay much bigger clutches than our native snails and slugs do. Uh, I um, was studying some native snails and slugs in uh, grad school, and there was one species in particular that would lay three every time, just three, that was it. Anyway, 88 eggs makes 88 babies. And this is what a baby snail looks like when it hatches. So um, yes, snails are hatched with their shell. Uh, and, and this is probably one of my biggest frequently asked questions. Uh, people ask, what, uh, does a snail crawl out of its shell and find a new one? No, 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 that's hermit crabs. And that's on marine coasts, not here. No, um, think of a snail shell like our fingernails you don't lose your fingernails and go get new ones, right? Uh, well, I guess you could get press-ons, but that's a different thing, right? You grow your own fingernails. 
same like snails. So from even from when they're inside the egg, you can see the snail shell starting. Uh, so they grow, it starts out with one whirl, we call that, and then the world just simply grows around and around. The snail isn't really getting bigger per se, but the shell is growing because it's going around and around and around. Um, now, um, this is a little, little disturbing, but it's true. Our fingernails, if left to their own devices, could grow really long too. And you know what? They curl up like snail shells. So I was, I was thrilled several years ago when this picture appeared in the BBC News that this man from India grew his fingernails and they became kind of snail shell like. Okay, um, avert your eyes if you're disturbed. Going on now. Um, this is back to snails and what they look like. So uh, this is actually uh, what you see above is uh, the three eggs, uh, or actually this was four, excuse me, uh, four eggs from this particular species of snail, which is found only in Southern Illinois. It's a rare endemic species. And I watched the eggs develop. You can see the eye starting to develop through the translucent gelatinous eggshell. And then here you can actually see, this is the very first whirl of the snail shell. Snail hatches, it eats its eggshell right away because it's mm, yum, free protein right there. And then it goes on and it eats very small bits of decaying vegetation and it grows around, like I said. So by the time it hits a few months old, the, the, the world, so the spiral has gone around and around and around. Now, baby snails are small, but we're gonna segue a little bit because this is one of the most exciting things I wanna tell you, that when you think you're seeing snails outside, the ones that you're probably mostly seeing are introduced snails, especially in central New York. We have quite a few that are big, large, kind of colorful. They have stripes. Some of them are, are different um, shades of brown or even pink and yellow, and those are introduced. But my favorite snails are the teeny ones. Here's your search image. If you were going to go out and find some locally native snails, think small. You're going to be peering into the soil, the grass, under logs, under rocks, and finding something that is, is quite tiny. This snail measures less than three millimeters across, so think less than a lentil's width. Uh, I don't have particularly good eyes. I use reading glasses to help find them. And I bend down and I just peer through the grass or, or the soil for long periods of time. Um, should anybody who doesn't know me go walking past, they usually ask me if I'm looking for my keys. Have I lost them? And do I need help? Uh, they either think I've lost my keys or maybe my mind. But this is what you do. You have to really look down and peer very closely if you're looking for land snails. Okay. So here's a bunch of them. Uh, these are ones I collected back in grad school from Illinois and uh, lots of uh, species here in this one little photo. The scale bar is about five millimeters. So it just goes to show that yes, yes, we got a lot of diversity going on at a tiny, tiny scale. In fact, 95% of our snail species, our native snail species in North America are smaller than a lentil. So smaller than about five millimeters. There's a live one here on the left side. So you can see, yes, and those teeny tiny snails, they too have a heart and a lung and they are busy carrying out their lives, but in a very small way. Uh, I took this photo of the tiniest snails in North America laid out on a penny so you could really get a feel. Again, these are not baby snails. These are full adult snails. Uh, the very smallest on this is uh, Gupia sterkii. Uh, I'm sorry, I actually don't know the common names of a lot of our native snails. And in fact, a lot of them don't have common names, which is uh, kind of a shame because uh, people get to know things through field guides and uh, through talking about common names. It's something that I have a goal of working on in life to help popularize them. But I have to tell you, one of my favorite snail names is punctum, punctum minutissimum up here in the upper right corner here. Uh, it literally means small, very, very small. So that's how tiny these guys are. 
Um, so uh, what are they doing? This is, this is, this is, uh, they're, they're out there. They're small. They're, they're at um, the uh, uh, hidden in places. You can't see them readily. They must be doing something out there and they're not eating your vegetable garden and they're not eating your flower gardens and they're definitely not eating your hostas because our native snails, even if you gave them a grand bowl of vegetables, they would have no interest. This is what they're doing. They're performing services for the ecosystem. So a lot of a snail's world is just clean up because there is always decaying leaf litter, uh, decaying vegetation from, uh, there, there's decaying fungi. Somebody's got to clean that up and it's the snails. And they spend a lot of their time under things doing just that. They also can be cleanup crews for uh, carrion. So um, you can find tiny native snails. So the one inside is a native snail and the larger shell is not a native snail, but it's doing a little job in there. And the, the larger yellowish snail has perished and the smaller snail is finding um, some, something good to eat in there and cleaning it up. And what happens to snails when they, they die, when they've lived their lives and they uh, are no more? The shell persists in the ecosystem for quite a while. I have a friend, a dear friend, Timothy Pierce at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, and he's the malacologist there for many years. And, and he tried to uh, do a study, he did a study of burying snail shells or leaving them out and marking them and going back and seeing what's happening. Are they still there? So, you know, they, it's kind of handy that they stick around a while. For one, it's evidence that we say a snail was there, but other organisms in nature are gonna use those snails. So here we have, there's a species of ant that actually uh, uses empty snail shells. And I got this particular snail back to my lab thinking it was a dead empty shell. Uh, I was about to identify it, label it and all that and um, uh, tapped it out and found all these sna um, snail uh, ants in there with their uh, larvae and pupae in there that they were taking care of. So how neat is that? Um, so here's another ecosystem service that is very understudied, but fascinating that snails do this. We have evidence, good evidence that snails out there are pollinating certain plants. So one is um, uh, on the right side, pollinated by slugs. This is in the Denver Botanic Garden. And uh, it is, they've been, uh, um, no, no formal paper on this yet, but they've watched and noticed that slugs are the only things that were really interested in wild ginger flowers. So think of the kinds of plants that don't have a big showy flower blossom that's out in the sun. Think about the ones that are in the damp areas that are in the understory. And um, it's not something that flying insects like maybe bees are going to find as readily or be interested in. It's just not really their territory. And a lot of the flowers like wild ginger uh, kind of smell like carrion. So uh, slugs will get in there and slurp up nectar and bring it along to the next flower, thus pollinating it. The best study that's out there that needs to be replicated and uh, um, needs to be done with lots of different species is this one uh, by Sarma and other scientists in 2007, um, in this little snail, the Lamalaxis gracile is a, a little elongated snail. They didn't get great photos for their paper, but what they found is this. It was responsible for doing most of the pollination work for a species of morning glory in India. Uh, and this happens on rainy, cool, damp mornings when the insect pollinators were not active. So they counted these little bright dots here are pollen grains that they counted on the body of the snail and on the shell of the snail. And they found indeed that the, the snails were bringing pollen from flower to flower. 
uh, uh, again, I'd love to see more studies like this someday in my copious spare time or when I retire, I'd like to do something like this. Uh, my own observations have uh, uh, mixed results. These are just anecdotal findings. But what I found was, uh, sadly, uh, it's the invasive slugs in our area that are pollinating trillium. So what, trillium is another one of those flowers that's low to the ground and not so much being pollinated by insects, but rather slugs. And um, Aryan slugs are... Uh, highly invasive. They're one of our worst problematic slugs in the Northeast and beyond right now. Even in the past 20 years, they've become worse. Uh, these guys will eat everything in their path. Are they doing pollination? Yes, I think so. I had taken some swabs uh, from these slugs and looked at it under magnification. And yeah, they're, get, they're picking up pollen all right. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe an, even an invasive snail or slug could be, be doing something good. Um, but here, here's the main job that snails are doing and why we can't have a healthy ecosystem without them. Our native snails are eating very low on the food web. So they're taking up nutrients from decaying vegetation, from lichens, from mushrooms and other fungi. And from that, they're gleaning calcium and magnesium and other nutrients that are vital to the life of many animals. And in turn, they become food for many other animals. And I am A-OK -okay with that because look how much life snails are supporting. I always ask people, uh, if you like fireflies, then you ought to uh, thank the snails because snails are the main food for many species of fireflies. Uh, for their larvae in particular, they will uh, glean them right out of their shells. Uh, and um, uh, it's good protein, it's good nutrients. And this is why uh, we have fireflies in areas where there are lots of snails. Lots of reptiles eat snails and depend on them too. So we've got, uh, this is not one of our own snakes here, but certainly garter snakes are big snail consumers and even young rat snakes and, uh, and other snakes when they're young, are gonna eat the smaller ones. And when they're bigger, they're gonna eat the bigger ones. Um, lizards, turtles, uh, our land uh, turtles, especially are gonna be eating snails. Good food for them. And they'll crunch down on the whole shell. Everybody knows probably around here, the, the redback salamander is one of the most common salamanders. It's hard to go in the woods, turn over a log and not see some. And look how tiny they start out. Look at that wee little one on the right. Again, that's my fingernail there. That was just, just a, a tiny, tiny little young juvenile redback salamander. And uh, the, they are eating snails. So if you see salamanders, think snails. You're gonna see snails in the same environment micro environment that is that you're seeing them. Birds. So this is an area that is in uh, dire need of more study because we've got a lot of, of uh, changes happening in, in today's world with climate change uh, is greatly affecting snails. When we have acid rainfall, when we have different weather conditions, when we have wildfires, it is wiping out snails. Uh, so a lot of animals can get up and run and fly and get out of harm's way, but uh, not snails. If you destroy a patch of land, if um, it, it always breaks my heart when, it, when there's a patch of woods that I've seen for a long time, drive by or whatever, and then all of a sudden it's being turned into a parking lot for businesses, stores, what have you. Uh, that's a lot of snail habitat that's been destroyed forever. You can't bring them back. And what's happening out there is a lot of birds are snail eaters, especially thrushes. This song thrush is a European species, but closely related cousin of it here, we have the wood thrush. Uh, a good study was done on the song thrush showing that because of uh, as, uh, acidic rainfall, acidic 
acidified, acidified soils, there were fewer snails in an area where um, the song thrushes were nesting. Uh, and uh, snails are vital for uh, their calcium. When uh, I'm in the woods, I always look at tree stumps and rocks. And the images on the right of the screen are broken, busted up snail shells. So unlike a turtle, which is, or a tortoise is going to chomp down on the entire snail, the threshers will beat the snail and they will try to get all those bits of shell off. So um, other birds that eat snails are turkeys. And uh, remember those tiny little snails we saw earlier in the presentation? Well, those, those tiny little snails uh, are often found in the, um, what's the part of a turkey, the, is the gullet. So um, this study was done and it showed that turkey hens in particular, the females were eating 30% more snails before they, in the weeks before they were going to lay their eggs. So um, without good calcium mineral content in the diet of birds, they cannot lay viable eggs. Some of the studies have shown uh, weak eggshells. They've shown that the embryos can't uh, develop properly. Uh, mammals uh, have the ability to sequester calcium from their own bones and support the developing fetus, but birds can't do that. Birds have very thin hollow bones and they're not able to share their calcium loads. They have to get it from their diet. And so many of them get it from snails. What else eats snails? Chipmunks. Yes, cute little chippies. It's not just nuts and things that they're munching on. They're actually out there eating snails. And uh, interestingly, I find a lot of these uh, invasive snails uh, called the grove snail. The ones that come in all the different colors and can be striped. Chipmunks love them, so do squirrels. And what they do is they um, um, nibble off the, the top of the shell, the inner whorls, and they kind of kind of like opening a, a can of sardines and they'll just eat out the yummy flesh of the snail. Good protein rich snack. There are some snails that eat other snails. So whenever I'm taking a group out for a snail study, I tell them, look, we've got lots of snails to identify and some of them are really hard to tell apart. But if there is only one snail that you can remember how to tell, it is this, the grayfoot lands tooth snail because it's the carnivorous snail of our area in the Northeast. Uh, it's very recognizable, it's a very flat snail. It's sort of a greenish olive color of the shell. And when you turn it over, this, this, what we call, again, the umbilical view of it, or the underside of the shell, is very wide open, so you could actually see the inner whorls in it. That's a great lens tooth. What does it do? It it's adapted with an especially long body region uh, that's quite thin, and it, it's... Um, it's a bit gruesome. It'll go inside the shell of a living snail and eat it alive. And do you remember when we saw the image with the radula with all those little rows of teeth? Uh, the, the teeth of the gray foot lance tooth are longer and more barbed. So it, it does a good bit of flesh munching in there and pulls the flesh into its mouth. Uh, so poor snail has nowhere to run in high. Hi, but yeah, this is nature. This is a very uh, native snail to this area and it's a good snail to have around too. All right, so um, if people often ask me this, this is one of my frequently asked questions, aren't snails vectors parasites? Well, they are. Fortunately for us, uh, unless you go out and, and eating raw snails, don't do that. Uh, that's about the only way you're, you're going to be infected by them. We, we don't have uh, some of the terrible diseases that some uh, parts of the world have with snails, but we do have a number of snails that are vectors for parasites. Uh, and this is one of the most fun ones to show you. This is the zombie snail, as it's called. And it's uh, not, the snail did not start out like a zombie. The snail started out as a, a, a amber snail. We've got about eight or nine species of amber snail in New York state. Um, some of them are introduced and a lot of them are invasive. I think this was one of the introduced 
species. But anyway, um, this little species of a flatworm uh, invades the snail uh, because it's eaten by the snail. The life cycle goes like this. Part of the life of this uh, leucochloridium species worm is in a songbird. And the songbird poops out the eggs of it which are along comes a snail and it will eat the eggs and then the worm grows inside the snail. And what is happening here is that in the eye stalk, the tentacles, we call these the upper tentacles, is the worm's body. And it's doing this most peculiar thing. Uh, again, trigger warning, avert your eyes if this grosses you out, but it, it's really fun, it's, it's, it's trippy, hold on. And what is happening here is that uh, the, the worm is uh, causing the snail to be out in the open, which the snail would not normally be doing. And it's making rather a display of itself. And what does that look like to a bird? If you were a bird passing over here, you got, wow, mm, mm, really good wiggly banded worm that looks like something good to eat and what happens then is the bird will peck off one or sometimes both of the tentacles of this poor creature and ingest the worm when it ingests the worm the the life cycle continues within the bird's body and then uh it uh will produce eggs which then get pooped out picked up by another snail so i hope you're all still with me and doing it okay but that's that's pretty cool there are other types of parasites that snails are intermediate hosts for. Um, uh, sadly, this one, the deer brain worm, um, deer will pick up snails when they're out browsing uh, and they'll pick a part of it. It's a roundworm in this one. Uh, and again, they'll poop it out and it'll get picked up by a snail or a slug when they're in the grass uh, and um, uh, feed on it. and the life cycle continues. Uh, I say the sad part of this, uh, it can affect deer adversely, but more so than deer, it, aff it affects some of our farm animals. So it, it's um, a terrible parasite for goats, uh, also for camelids, so llamas and alpacas are also affected by it. I had a goat, uh, I keep goats, and one of my dearest goats died uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we weren't sure she had a brain tumor or if she was affected by this. Uh, we'll never know. I didn't didn't have the full workup, but um, they exhibit similar symptoms to something like a brain tumor where they're confused and running into things. So yeah, uh, this happens. Okay, um, but going back to some of the good things that snails do in our ecosystem, uh, they're there for a reason and they're supporting a lot of other life. Uh, and it's us who are the greatest enemy of the land snails. We are uh, removing far too much of the habitat that they need to survive and thrive. And you can't put it back, we, you, it's gone forever. Um, what can we do? What can we do to help? So I'm gonna look at some things. Um, and, and I hope at this point in the presentation that I've helped to, to uh, um, I don't know, maybe help you shift your mindset a little bit that not all snails are bad. Okay, so again, 115 or so species in New York State and the vast majority of them are native. So um, knowing what's out there is the very first step. So um, how do you learn to identify land snails? I wish I could pull off my shelf a field guide to land snails. I've got some older ones that are from 1960s and 70s and I still use them. In the works is a field guide to the land snails of New York State uh, being worked on by some colleagues of mine and I've been a contributor to that over the past 10 years. Uh, we're looking for a publisher so I can keep you posted on how that's going. I think I've said this every year for the past several years but um, uh, there are not too many malacologists working on land snails, and it's very uh, challenging to get funding uh, and to prove to others, even scientists and, and uh, people who make decisions on uh, behalf of wildlife and preserving land, that these are important animals. So um, we have other things and other tools. 
but I'll just give you, go over the basics again. I've alluded to this several times in my talk so far this evening, but again, most thankfully of our snails and slugs are native. Uh, and um, some of them are these. We have lots of mantle slugs that are native. I have a whole slide on mantle slugs later. They want nothing to do with your hostas and plants and carrots and cucumbers. <clears throat> these guys eat a fungi in the woods. There's a few that are invasive and maybe you've seen some of these. The dusky arian over there on the right uh, comes in several color morphs. It's usually orange, there's brown, there's lighter yellow, and um, they're very destructive. And uh, I'm saddened when I find them in uh, areas where I'm also finding native snails because I, I think they can crowd them out. They're uh, reproduced uh, at a, a much greater rate than any of our natives do. The hairy snail has been a, discovered in our area in Ithaca first in, I think in the 1990s. Now I find them everywhere. Uh, um, so some documentation is needed there, but they, they, they just turn up everywhere around human habitation and sometimes not. Leopard slug, it's a big, big slug, uh, <laughs> pretty massive. They're also invasive. These guys will eat your garden. So you cannot like them, it's okay. So, so uh, here's a little trick <clears throat> to help you understand slugs. Uh, most, not all, but a great majority of the slugs that have what's called an anteriorly positioned mantle. So the mantle is this fold of skin and uh, in place of a shell, it offers a little bit of extra protection for the vital organs. So the snail's heart, lungs and, and stomach and intestines are, are up in here in, in the slug. Um, whereas the, uh, I should say all native actually in our area in the Northeast, the slugs that have the mantle that covers the entire body are native. Uh, and that's a really good way to differentiate. You have to get up close and look at them, but um, you'll see. So we, we want our native slugs around here. They're uh, quite special, and they feed almost exclusively on woodland fungi and lichens. Another way you can start to understand snails better is that, that the overall shape of the shell is one of the first things that we look at. <clears throat> uh, and the shells come in a variety of sizes. We, we have um, some of the larger ones, most of our larger ones in this area are these globos kind of a shell um, that uh, the grayfoot lance tooth was one that, that has this depressed, depressed uh, uh, helisform shell. Some are shaped like discs, some are shaped like, like, like a beehive. Uh, and then our tiny snails uh, often are, are like this. Succiniform, these are the amber snails, about eight to 10 species in New York state. Very hard to tell apart, actually, those snails, even for malacologists. And often we have to resort to uh, uh, DNA samples to get a really clear idea on them. Back to our search image. Okay, you're looking for these teeny tiny things and people think you're crazy looking for them, but what a joy it is to find them. Look how tiny they are. Uh, these are um, our native snails. Um, you, uh, uh, if your eyes are not great, I recommend good reading glasses as well as some loops. Things like this uh, are great because they have a light um, that, that, that shines and helps you to find tiny snails. Grass, I want you to get a search image going. You'd kind of be surprised. You, you're going to learn to recognize them a little better. Uh, I have uh, um, a real snail here. It, it's just the shell, the snail's no longer living, but just to give you uh, something that we, we can't do when we're in person and maybe can actually be a, uh, a plus for using Zoom is, do you see there's, uh, Trying minus the reflection, there's a tiny thing like a grain of sand at the bottom of this little little enclosed slide. That is one of these snails. So there's your search image. Look carefully. Okay. The best way to handle these things is one: take your antihistamines before you go hunting for tiny snails because one sneeze and they're all gone. The other way is you can pick them up with a very lightly damp paintbrush or a Q-tip and they stick to it. Uh, they're very statically 
charged. So when you put them in something, they're gonna be sticking to the sides, especially something plastic. Very easy to lose little snails. Uh, but um, this is one of the methods that I use when I'm handling them. Either that, also there's uh, paper thin forceps that you can get from biological companies. Sell them, um, they're very lightweight and they're good for not crushing a snail. It's, it's the saddest thing in the world when you find a, a little beauties like these and uh, it's crushed, that's, that's a bad day. I naturalist. So, so the Finger Lakes Land Trust and uh, Cayuga Nature Center and other groups have been sponsoring uh, bio blitzes lately. And um, if anybody's participated in them, you'll find not so many snails on them. Uh, the algorithm that identifies life on iNaturalist is uh, at its worst with snails. It cannot um, distinguish them. And that is simply because there's not enough in there. So I'm working towards making that easier. Um, what it really needs, it, what anybody needs to identify a snail properly is not just the top view of the shell. I can't tell you how many hundreds of photos I've received through email and the mail and people are sending me just the top. I can't tell for most of them, sorry folks, but three shell views uh, are best. So you want the top of the shell, which you call a top is called the apical view. You want the umbilical view because this gives you quite a few clues. Different species will have what's called the umbilicus, this hole here, either open, sometimes it's partially covered and sometimes it's all the way covered depending on the species. Um, <clears throat> and the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the apertural view is also helpful because of the shape of the opening. Um, so all these things are, are good. So when you upload a photo, try to do as many as you can. Um, this, is, this is just a very small sampling of some of the land snails that we've got that are native to New York. Oh, oh both native and non. Uh, but again, that's, that, that's, that's a nice number. Um, there's probably more than that. It, in fact, over the past 10 years, we've had new, newly described species of snails in the United States. Uh, they've been the tiny species because there's just not that many people studying them. Mantle slugs deserve uh, little special extra stories. They're, they're, they're quite charming. Uh, they will never eat anything in their garden. I promise you that. Uh, and they love woodland mushrooms and they love to eat lichens. Uh, so if you're out on a cool damp, maybe rainy morning in the woods, that's when you're most likely to find them. And they're very hard to tell apart in terms of species. Uh, I'm working on a species guide that's gonna make that a little easier. But with these guys, you, it, it's not just the pattern. A lot of the patterns look the same. You also have to look at the underside of the foot. So that's why I very carefully see this one on the lower right, I turned over the end of its tail and it's a little bit of an orange color and that's Philomycus togatus. So, okay, <laughs> we have to look at um, the overall form and the shape and the color and, and the modeling, uh, but uh, um, they're still hard. They're, they're very hard to tell apart. And sometimes you get one like this and when they are scared, you know, they, they're not uh, pulling into a shell, they kind of bunch themselves up and they look like, what does that look like to you? Like a piece of poo. So it doesn't look like much, but you can overlook them very easily. Uh, so, um, so what is a malacologist? Malacologist person who studies snails, and there's so much we want to know. We have more unanswered questions than we have answered. And even uh, when I say malacologist, that is not only people who study land snails, but it's people who study clams. And, and squid and octopus. And uh, there's the American Malacological Society that you can reach at that link, or if you just look up American Malacological Society, if you have a sincere interest to learn more. And um, a, a, very, uh, a handful of us are interested in land snails. Uh, these are the kinds of things we wanna know, but above all, we, we wanna gather data because we wanna know what are the species we care about for conservation efforts.
And where can we make recommendations for land to preserve? Uh, because in some cases, snails are endemic to a very, very small area only and nowhere else. Here's an example of that. So uh, the Chitnango ovate amber snail looks like a typical amber snail, but uh, there is only a very small population of these remaining. They live in one spot of a few square meters at near the base of Chittenango Falls and no place else in the world, that's it. So there are efforts underway to maintain this as uh, a little refuge for the snails, trying to keep people out, just walking on the paths uh, there, one must be very careful. It's a hard hat area, um, that's me in a hard hat, uh, because there have been several major rock slides uh, over the recent years that uh, uh, the few square meters where these snails uh, inhabit have been reduced to even less square meters of where they live. So um, a team is out there uh, tagging them every year, breeding them in captivity and monitoring populations. Uh, very, very challenging work. And um, uh, uh, I'm due for a visit to catch up with the team and see how things are going. But um, they, uh, in the past at least, have taken on volunteers. Don't know what things are like now with COVID era, but um, this is the uh, person. I can give you her name later or contact me if you're interested. Uh, so what about your own home? If you're blessed with a piece of property that has some natural areas, I urge you to leave them natural for the sake of all wildlife, for your native plants, for your birds, for your snails undisturbed areas are best. Leave off the chemicals everywhere you can. If you have to use chemicals, try to avoid them in certain areas and just leave things natural. Leave some fallen logs, leave some, some branches down, leave some leaf litter. These are all great for snails. You probably don't even know what snails you have on your property. Um, a little story uh, of just how much these tiny snails really are everywhere. Some years ago, I visited a good friend of mine. Hmm, maybe she's on this call. I don't know. Um, she lives north of Denver, Colorado, and she and her family had moved out there from the east. And I said, well, have you found the snails in your backyard? And she said, oh, no, Marla, this is Colorado. It's too dry here. We don't have any snails. And I said, can I have five minutes in your backyard? And I did. And I looked under things and I looked under some uh, leaf litter and under some rocks. And within a few minutes, I found, I don't know, three or four species of tiny snails. They're everywhere. Got to look. You just got to look. Um, so, so try to leave what, what you can natural in your property and you will have a population of snails. Beach trees. I mentioned beach trees because they're full of calcium. You can often find snails at the bases of beech trees or in beech tree leaf litter. The leaves are very high in calcium. And, and just a, a little urging, especially for kids, you get excited when you find a snail, you, you say, hey, look, and you want to show your friends and you want to photograph it. Please put it back where you found it. The, again, these are organisms of low vigility. They're not getting around very much in their lifetime. And if you pick up a snail and you move it elsewhere, you, you've kind of just changed the course of its life. So Let's put them back where they're from. <clears throat> Finally, uh, you know, I, I've always tried to end my talk by not talking about the invasive snails, but it seems like I have to because it's my number one question. So if you've already asked that question, or if you're thinking about that question, and you really do want to get rid of the snails in your vegetable garden uh, and off your hostas and et cetera, uh, here's some little things you can do. Uh, this, this in my hands there is a bunch of sticky, nasty, invasive snails and slugs. Hand removal, pick them up. You can wear a glove if you don't like to touch them. And hey, do you have chickens or ducks? Well, they love to eat them. So I pick them up and I give them a handful and everybody's happy. Uh, there are some products on the market called Slogo is one and the main active ingredients of it, it's a pellet, but you uh, um, pour out some Slogo and the Slogo has some uh, uh, iron, uh, I can't remember exactly what compound. It's an iron compound. It's uh, harmless to wildlife and humans and slugs eat it and they die. Um, <clears throat> there's also copper. Uh, I know copper is kind of expensive, but if you uh, surround some of your plants with that, 
the snails and slugs do not like copper. They cannot tolerate it very well. Um, if you get some guinea fowl, they'll, they're great at picking off snails and slugs. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say about the invasives. I really hope that by the end of this year, I have left you with a new appreciation of snails if you didn't have one already. And um, you know what? Uh, I think of it this way a lot these days. Uh, uh, our planet, uh, our world, societies have uh, become full of really tragic occurrences and uh, really sad news uh, um, every day. Um, we have to find the little things that make us happy uh, and that are wonders of life that can be right near us and before us. And uh, even if you have just a few minutes to spend in nature, if, if you find a snail, just spend some time with it, get to know it, watch its heartbeat. And I hope that brings you some peace. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Marla. Um, that was really great. We have a Edie. questions. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? I think you're still on mute. Mm -mm. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. <laughs> that was weird. Thank you. That was really great. We have a couple questions. Happy to take them. Okay, great. Um, See, Simon Wyatt is wondering, how identifiable do snails tend to be in the field with a 10 magnification power hand lens? Can you figure most of them out all the way to species or do you tend to get stuck at genus, family, et cetera? <laughs> um, it, it depends. Uh, on the tiniest of the snails, I am often stuck at the genus level. And I have to come back and look at them under high power magnification. Um, when you have a juvenile snail, it's a challenge in the field too, because their adult characteristics are often little uh, projections inside the opening of the shell. Um, so to answer that question pretty generally is, is uh, it, it depends. If you're lucky if you get an adult snail and it's large enough to see, but yeah, with a little hand lens like, like like this, these are great. Um, it, it helps a great deal in at least getting to genus level. Great. Um, same person is wondering, um, is there a key or other reference you recommend for identifying snails? I'm in the process of building a new website uh, that's going to link us to some, some uh, ID guides. The best one I could recommend right now is from my friend, Tim Pierce, I mentioned earlier, is the curator of mollusks at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. And he has, uh, it's actually a guide to um, land snails of Pennsylvania, and he has another one, land snails of Virginia. But we have a lot of those species here. If we don't have the exact species, we have something in the same genus. If I can, I'll try, I'll try to put that, can I put that in the chat maybe? Okay, great. There's also a recommendation for Princeton University Press for the, the identification guide you were mentioning. If you're looking for a, oh, and Jill, I'm sorry, I don't wanna mispronounce your last name. Jill has a connection there. If you would like to be in touch, let me know and I can put the two of you in touch with each other. That would be fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Judy is wondering, what is the structure of the eye? Oh, oh, you know, I, I, um, in the interest of time, I didn't really even get to the eye. Um, but um, <laughs> the eye is uh, amazingly similar to a, a bird eye or a mammalian eye. And you're going, what the heck? These are just little slimy guys, right? No. Um, um, so a snail's eye, uh, the eyes here are at the tips of these upper tentacles. There's two sets of tentacles. So these lower ones sticking out here are for smelling and tasting. And they're the ones that usually touch the ground when the snail's moving around. And these upper ones here, there's an eye. Uh, the eye actually has a retina. It has a teeny tiny lens 
uh, with little muscle tissues. I've dissected eyes and uh, been amazed at what I find. Uh, from what I understand, the lens doesn't do a whole lot of focusing, if any focusing at all, but uh, there's no doubt that they see light and dark. Uh, interestingly, the eye is not just an eye. Again, there's, there's so many alien things about snails that I love. It's, it's for uh, seeing, smelling, tasting, uh, and touching. So these upper tentacles, there's actually more uh, chemoreceptors in there for taste than there are in these lower ones that are actually touching the ground. So they, when they, they crawl about, they're waving these around and they're seeing, smelling, touching, uh, finding food. Does that help? Okay. Um, is there a life, do snails have a lifespan? Yeah. Um, oh, most snails in nature are going to live maybe just a few years because they're usually going to get eaten by something. So maybe less than a few years. Uh, but <laughs> Oddly, I had one native snail that I kept as part of a grad school observation uh, that survived with me for 13 years. That is the snail in this photo, by the way. Uh, uh, in 13 years, I had that snail because it had a very good life in a terrarium um, and uh, it didn't have any of the stresses of the natural world. And I just observed it for all those years. Um, that's about, a, it's probably a record. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. What is your specific area of study? Well, um, so uh, I have a day job. I'm actually an online course developer at the Lab of Ornithology and I love my job. So, um, but uh, I do snaily stuff on the weekends and evenings as I can. Uh, and on vacation time. And my greatest interest is, is trying to document the diversity of snails out there. That's one, that's really the main thing that I really feel needs to be done. We don't know what's out there. How can you know what to conserve if you don't know what's out there? Um, and two, I'm very interested in um, snail pollination and also the, another service, ecological service I didn't get to talk to is uh, about fungal spores. There are certain types of fungal spores that cannot be viable until they pass through the gut of a snail or a slug. And there's not so much we know about those yet either, but um, I think that's a fascinating area. Very few people looking at it. So uh, that's where I'd like to spend my time. For now, uh, I'm, I'm involved more in the citizen science projects in bio blitzes and my own observations, just trying to get out there and finding, oh, wow, there's a new population of, um, uh, Valonia snails that I didn't know existed in this area. Now I know. And education, <laughs> talking to people like yourselves to uh, help you understand how important snails are and not to uh, um, let's lessen our hate for snails when it comes to the snails that are invasive and getting into our gardens. Okay, we have a just a couple of new questions, Marla. Um, does anybody study snail intelligence? Is there any indication that any snail species have intelligence similar to their cephalopod cousins? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know, and we all know octopus uh, are, are so intelligent, right? And and um, as are cuttlefish and and squid. Uh, snails have nothing like that, except that they do indeed have. Uh, cerebral ganglia in the head region and they learn and that's been documented by studies that they remember where food is they uh, know enough to follow the trails of the same species of snails uh, and to avoid predatory snails uh, and so they do learn these things and they're creatures of habit so they'll take the same path because it's the known okay I've learned this is safe and I've learned there's food at the other end. Uh, yeah, and there, there are some studies out there about snail intelligence and learning. So what little cerebral ganglia they have are, uh, they're doing something. Okay, um, you said 
are 115 snail species in New York State. Does that also include slugs? And if so, approximately what percentage of that total is slugs? Um, uh, I probably need to up, up, uh, um, uh, what, what's the word? <laughs> Catch up uh, on that uh, better myself and do a count. Uh, the slugs that are native are mantle slugs, and I believe we have between um, five to eight native mantle slugs. So out of that 115, and uh, we have another five major invasive slugs. It's the same five major invasive slugs that do most of the damage to crops and, and gardens and strawberry crops and all that. Does that help? So, so roughly, let's say maybe, maybe, maybe 15 of the 115 are probably slugs. Mm -hmm. I'd like to come up with the, the, the better number for you because I do have the list. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. on the top of that. Um, and then lastly, how many species? Oh, not lastly, sorry. How many species of native freshwater snails do we have around here? Uh, not, not as good on the freshwater snails, uh, but we have a bunch. We, we, I think there's, I would say, venture to say it's between maybe 20 and 30 or so in the state, but I could be wrong. I have an older publication on freshwater uh, snails in, of New York State. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those are actually invasive too. Um, Ian, maybe you can elaborate. I'm not sure if you mean Marla's home or in anyone's home, but how many slugs or snails do you think are in your home? In my home, my personal property? That's what I was wondering. Um, uh, well, if, if the uh, question asker could elaborate, uh, is it a yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> um, yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, let me do a quick count in my head. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, uh, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12, uh, 12 snail species. Um, and only once did I ever find a native slug and the rest of the slugs, uh, one, two, three, uh, are invasive. How's that? So how many slugs are in your backyard, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to discover <laughs> what you got there. At least you, he says, okay. <laughs> um, have you studied sales in other countries? I lived in Italy for some, some years and uh, Sicily in particular was very interested in the, there's a huge amount of snail diversity there uh, that they are native and <clears throat> uh, informal study. I know I've, I've not, not written anything about uh, Italian snails, but what, to my delight, uh, there's a lot of really calcareous limestone areas. Um, if anybody's been to Sicily, there are uh, ancient Greek temple remains. In fact, some of the Greek temples you find in Sicily are better examples of Greek temples than you find in Greece. And there's one in particular called Suggesta and uh, it's on a hilltop. And I only found this, this one, uh, wasn't the only snail I found there, but uh, in all my travels, I, there was a snail that seemed to be endemic to that hill and particularly loved that temple. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> okay. Um, Is that 31 questions coming in? What, well, if, if you could record the chat, I'd, I'd love to know. I don't think I can, I don't know if I'll catch everything. Yeah, I can, I can send all these questions to you. Uh-huh. Sure. There's, um, I'm at the end here though. Um, someone is wondering any tips for keeping a snail terrarium? Terrarium? Terrarium, uh, sorry, yeah. yes. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, um, well, uh, I've, I've made it a habit now not to make pets of them. I, I really love observing snails in nature, but if you have a terrarium it, in, and uh, not so big snail, a couple things, you wanna keep a tight 
lid on it, screen mesh so that it can breathe. Um, if you've gotten yourself an introduced snail, it will eat anything you give it like carrots and, and uh, especially they like uh, cucumbers and uh, Brussels sprouts and collards and broccoli. They like calcareous vegetables, the cruciferous vegetables. Keep uh, the terrarium sprayed with some water. Uh, avoid uh, cleaning it with soaps and things like that. And the water you use, be sure it's not chlorinated. Oh, um, and, and uh, snails can self-fertilize. So <clears throat> one snail can very quickly turn into 88 snails, <laughs> like mine did. Um, so if you don't want baby snails, um, uh, you can remove the eggs, you can put them back where you found the original snail. If you want to just keep the snail for observation for a while, you know, keep it, look at it, uh, make friends with it, give it a name, uh, consider returning it to where it, came, where it came from after a while. Although, I, again, I kept mine for 13 years, so uh, I'm not the snail rule maker. <laughs> All right. Um, which snails do we eat? Eh, uh, thankfully, uh, none that we have in this area. Uh, and don't eat them, please. Uh, it, uh, we sometimes have this, this weird problem, like uh, uh, people who love mushrooms and want to know, oh, can you eat this? Can you eat that? No, no, don't eat any snails. Uh, some of them carry parasites, so uh, just don't do it. And they're not very meaty anyway. Uh, the snails that are escargot snails are typically, um, the species name is cornu aspersum. Uh, they're originally, they were a European snail. There are snail farms. I heard about one, on, I think on Long Island or somewhere downstate. Um, and, and they're big and they're meaty. And supposedly it's the garlic butter. I don't know. I've never eaten one. I know way too much about their internal anatomy and, you know, where, you know, the anus empties out and things like that. Uh, no interest in eating snails for me. All right. Um, your snail illustrations are beautiful. Did you study illustration in college or just practice on your own? Well, that's, that's a nice, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, I, I've been an artist uh, since I could hold a crayon. I, uh, life, lifelong um, artist, illustrator, I started doing professional artwork in the early 90s, um, thanks to uh, a university course on science illustration. And <clears throat> shortly after that, I joined the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators. So if there are any illustrators or budding illustrators out there, particularly who are interested in doing natural science subjects, uh, uh, talk to me later or just look up gnsi.org. It's the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators. Uh, extremely great organization, can't say enough good about it. We're all friendly. We're all uh, willing to share our techniques and how we do things. And um, we've been having virtual conferences for the last two years, but normally we meet somewhere uh, every year in person and, and just, just have a blast. We're nature geeks. We, we have field trips, we go out, we find things, we, we draw things, we draw on the field. Um, we do both traditional art techniques as well as uh, um, digital computer illustration. So I've learned, uh, I've, uh, a lot of me is self-taught, but then I uh, continually constant learning from my peers and from uh, workshops through the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators. And with scientists, um, uh, one thing I do on the side is I illustrate new species of snails, uh, also of rotifers. I like things that are little and hard to see with the naked eye. Um, and uh, you can learn an awful lot about your subject when you're working with scientists who really specializes in it. So for example, one of my best clients for many years is at UC Berkeley, and she studies micro marine mollusks uh, so these are uh, uh, fossil mollusks, so they're extinct, but she has teeny tiny shells and uh, I draw those and she describes new species. <clears throat> well, I guess that's it, Marla. I'll send all these comments and questions to you through mm. email. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thanks, you've been a great audience and um, I hope you can, um, uh, uh, 
share what you share, share what you've learned tonight with with your friends, with your buddies, with your gardeners. Yes, you can be mad at the invasive snails and slugs, but let's let's um, respect the native ones are very, very important to the ecosystem. Uh, maybe I leave you with one more thing. Another frequently asked question is, how did the invasive snails and slugs get here? Well, they've been coming probably since the time of the Mayflower. So uh, snails and slugs and their eggs are stowaways on those types of ships because the early settlers, uh, the early colonists brought with them their favorite plants and vegetables and pots of soil. Uh, and uh, snails were transported over. So by uh, DNA studies, we can see actually how long some of our snails that are from Europe are now in the US or in Canada. So um, some of them date back to those early settlement times. Okay. Thank you, Marla. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, someone just asked, but I'll just reiterate that um, tonight's recording will be posted to the new section of the Finger Lake Slantress website, hopefully by the end of the week. So it's flt.org slash news. <laughs> so um, yeah, look for and that. Thanks again for um for supporting the Finger Lakes Land Trust. Uh, I, I hope if, if you don't already, please do consider it. Uh, um, and uh, I always love your newsletters and hearing the news uh, that there's more and more lands acquired. And I have so many places I haven't yet visited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Marla. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for it's, joining a, it's a good us. rainy night. If you go out early tomorrow, you might be able to find some native snails. Take care. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank Bye. You. Good night, everyone.